Greetings, fellow workers. Welcome to the 50th anniversary symposium on Jeremy Brecker's strike. My name is Todd Vashan, and I'm the director of the Labor Education Action Research Network, or just LEARN, in the School of Management and Labor Relations at Rutgers University. I'm very excited to be here with you all tonight to discuss some of my favorite topics, working class history, organizing, and power building. One of the greatest sources of power we have as workers, both paid and unpaid, and mostly underpaid, is the ability to withhold our labor or our cooperation and participation in systems of oppression. When we join together in solidarity, there's nothing we cannot achieve. The potential power is actualized when we organize, and as history has shown, it often manifests in the form of strikes. This is a subject that motivates and animates the book that brings us all together this evening, Jeremy Brecker's Strike. I have not yet had my 50th anniversary, so I can't speak about the initial release and reception of the book in 1970, but thankfully we have someone with us tonight who can. I first read Strike in the 1990s when I was a member of the Laborers International Union and working at Millstone Nuclear Power Station in Eastern Connecticut as a fire watch. I very vividly remember the sense of rebellion and pride I felt bringing the book into work with me through the security checkpoint each day that summer. You'd have to scan your palm, go through the metal detectors, pass the bomb sniffing dog while the highly armed militaristic guards rummaged through your bags. Well, inside my bag was my lunch and a copy of Strike and some vitamins, which I naively hoped would reduce the ill effects of radiation exposure something that I had looked up and researched at that great American socialist institution, the public library, where I had also borrowed the copy of Strike I was reading that summer. It was not until about 17 years later that I actually met Jeremy when he was helping to organize the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs. And I was working with my fellow graduate employees at the University of Connecticut to organize our graduate employee union. So big shout out to the GEU UAW 6950. I'm sure you're out there. I know you're out there. Well, we invited Jeremy to come speak with our organizing committee at that time and had a fabulous conversation about the power of organizing. We then went on to win recognition for our 2100 member local in 2014 and our first contract in 2015. Our local stayed very involved in labor climate work, which led to many, many more opportunities for further collaboration with Jeremy over the years. He's been a great mentor and a personal friend ever since, which is why I'm so excited to hear some of the backstory of Strike the book that has brought so many of us into labor activism, raised awareness and interest in labor history, and just brought people into activism in general. But before we jump into it, I want to extend my thanks to the many people and organizations that helped to make this event a reality. So first, a shout out to my Rutgers colleagues and friends, Janice Fine and Marilyn Snyderman, and the whole Center for Innovation and Worker Organization have been doing such great work on bargaining for the common good. Big ups to the entire Labor Network for Sustainability for making tonight possible, especially Judy Asman and Leo Blaine, who are behind the scenes right now, uh, running the boards, live streaming and live tweeting the event. And a big union power shout out to our friends at Labor Notes, who had intended to mark this anniversary last spring, but their plans, like so many other things, were derailed by COVID. Finally, thank you to all of you for joining, taking an interest in our collective history and all the organizing that you all do each day to make new history that will hopefully adorn the pages in future chapters of Strike. But enough from me, because you didn't come to hear me, you came to hear the amazing lineup of speakers that we have tonight, starting with Sarah Nelson. Are you guys ready to hear from Sarah? Let me see what's going on in the chat box. We guys ready to hear from Sarah? Sarah? <laughs> all right, that's what I'm talking about. So I'm sure everybody here knows who Sarah is, but if not, you are in for a real treat. Sarah has served as the International President of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA, since 2014. She first became a union member in 1996, around the time I was first reading Strike, when she was hired as a flight attendant at United Airlines. And today she represents nearly 50,000 of aviation's first responders at 17 airlines. The New York Times called her America's most powerful flight attendant for her role in helping to end the 35-day government shutdown. And In Style magazine placed her on their 2019 Top 50 Badass Woman list. She's number one on my list. When COVID-19 decimated the airline industry last year, Sarah worked closely with Congress to secure the payroll support program that keeps aviation workers employed and connected to healthcare during the pandemic, 
while banning stock buybacks and capping executive compensation. Sarah has also been a leading voice encouraging women to join unions and run unions. Her work has been featured in several popular news outlets, including CBS Sunday Morning, The Nation, The New Republic, Cosmopolitan, Salon, and PBS NewsHour. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to pass the mic to Sarah Nelson. Thank you, Todd, and thank you to everyone. Uh, I especially have to thank Jeremy Brecker for bringing us together and um, making it possible for us to celebrate 50 years of strike. And let me just say, Todd's you know, uh, explanation of going into that workplace and carrying this book um, through security each day and, and feeling the power in that is exactly what all of us should feel. So many people have been unwilling to say the word strike, but say it with me, strike, 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 strike. <laughs> During the government shutdown, I had academics and labor leaders asking me, should you really say, use the word strike? You might scare the pilots. Um, <laughs> I said, no, you have to say the word strike. We have to be willing to say it. Mother Jones. I, those of you who have heard me speak before know that I will often start or end with this quote because it's really all we need to know and it is echoed throughout all of the pages of 50 years of strike uh, that Jeremy has cataloged for us and helped us to understand the kind of power that working people have by coming together uh, in, in common good and common cause. But Mother Jones said the capitalists say there is no need of labor organizing, except that they themselves are continuously organizing and show their real beliefs. The capitalists want the most labor for the least money. The laborers want the most money for the least labor. Workers produce the wealth and build the world's palaces, but they neither use the wealth nor dwell in the palaces. And I just have to, yep, there you go. There's number one for those who, have, who are having shots for when Sarah cries tonight, talking about strike, <laughs> talking about worker power. There you go, there's one. Um, but Jennifer Bates behind me is one of the workers organizing for her union in the Amazon warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama right now. And she said, we're the billionaires. We just don't spend it. She also said, we're not robots designed only to live to work. We work to live. And that's the kind of power and clarity that can come out of a worker's lips when they understand what they can accomplish by standing together with the people around them. Mother Jones said, if you would only realize that you hold the solution of the whole problem in your own hands, you could settle the whole question easily. If for instance, instead of striking in small groups, every industry in America were to hold up. The capitalists would be obliged to yield to any and all demands for the world could simply not go on. And I just want to note how clear this has been. Yes, Strike was published before the first days of coronavirus, and so it's not in the pages of this book, but it gives us the foundation of everything that we need to know to fight back over what was so exposed during this past year. That we have allowed certain jobs to be defined as less valuable than others. That we have said that if you can't make enough in one job and the market doesn't provide enough money to pay for that person to have a living wage with one job, then you should go get another one and another one after that. And it doesn't matter if you can't sleep, just work harder. And if you don't like where you are, then go get another job. What's wrong with you? But the truth is that we couldn't have survived this last year if it had not been for grocery workers, if it had not been for sanitation workers, truck drivers, or educators who made things work in the worst of times, flight attendants who continued to bring medical equipment and medical personnel to critical assistance for those communities in need and bring our U.S. postal packages in the bellies of our plane that deliver 4 million prescription drugs to people all over the country every single day. If it were not for the work of essential workers on the front lines, if it were not for the work of the Amazon workers in those warehouses 
having to touch a box every eight seconds, having to be scolded by their bosses if they're not doing that fast enough or if they take too long to go to the bathroom. Having to do that and for no reason going into a space where they are putting their own lives at risk so the rest of us can live. And yet hazard pay has ended because the boss has decided that it's over because they see that the workers are not rising up to take their own. This is showing that we have way more in common than anything that could ever divide us. It's showing us that we have to set the agenda for the new green environment that we're going to create with the agenda that we set with a true just transition for working people, the agenda that we're going to set with this infrastructure bill right now that has to include labor rights. Because if you create millions of jobs, they are only good jobs if you make it possible for people to organize and hold the boss accountable, make them have to pay you a good wage, make them have to have safety and health provisions in the workplace, make them have to answer to your concerns. And I just wanna recognize that what's also so great about Strike is that Jer Jeremy Brecker makes clear, the main actors in the story are ordinary working people. What happens when people go to work? make a home shop and try to make a life may seem at first glance far removed from making history, but it's the only history that's ever mattered. He echoes what Mother Jones says and says that if we refuse to work, withdraw our cooperation, every social institution can be brought to a halt. By taking control of their own activity, they have the power to reshape society. These ordinary people going to work every day, just trying to have an ordinary life and be an ordinary family member, an ordinary mother and father, which to many kids is extraordinary. And that's, that's why we have to fight together because we have this common cause. There's nothing ordinary about it. There's nothing ordinary about working people standing together and understanding our power and understanding through strike the power that we have. Because the truth is the corporate elite have control and they have money. They have all the money in the world, but they don't truly have power. Jennifer Bates and her colleagues have made one of the richest people in the world have to answer <laughs> for the conditions that he's created in the warehouses that make him his billions. They've had to answer, they've been embarrassed, and he has even called upon his own staff, Jeff Bezos has called upon his own staff to fight back and to set a narrative that is totally removed from the working people. We pay $15 an hour. Everybody should be happy to work here. And if you're not, go find another job. That's the narrative that the boss always sets, but the boss is not connected to the people. And I think about what we learn in the pages of Strike and the working people and the immigrants who came together not even speaking the same languages, but when someone gets hurt on the job, when there's a mine explosion, when people speaking different languages are next to each other in houses, company houses or tents and having to tell their children or their father's not coming home. You don't have to speak the same language because you've got the same heart beating. You understand each other. And that's what strike does. It brings us together and helps define the fact that we have way more in common than anything that can divide us. And through our power together, we can change the course of history. Since strike was first published, Ronald Reagan fired the air traffic controllers. PATCO was a powerful union. They had a lot of money, they had a lot of solidarity. They set their demands clearly, but they failed to do what Mother Jones taught us to do. And that is to bring the community along with them, to have them understand the common cause together. And the rest of the labor movement failed to see that moment too. But that was a moment for all of us. That was a moment for, to stand up for the right to strike. And so when the government shutdown came along and Trump created that shutdown over the issue of the Southern border wall and the idea setting the idea, the narrative in this country that we are divided. It was the greatest union busting move of all time. 
And that shutdown was not going to be solved by some political compromise. There was no compromise because the desire of the person in the White House was to privatize everything, to dismantle all functions of government. He couldn't wait for the air traffic controllers to walk off the job again. He couldn't wait for the TSA officers to say that they could no longer come to work because they were too tired from sleeping in their cars because they couldn't afford the gas to get back and forth from home. It would have been okay if there were a catastrophic incident because that would have accrued more power to the executive. And once we understood that it was upon all of us, labor, to stand up for our federal sister, sector sisters and brothers who had been told in all kinds of op-eds all over the country, if the air traffic controllers don't come to work, this will be over. If they do it, if they do it, if they take control, it's all gonna be fine while we all sit back in our armchairs and watch while other people take on all the risk. That's not how strike works. That's not how solidarity works. And the strike is our tactic. And it has to be what we plan for every single time. And it is not a simple majority to make a strike work, but it's a full determination of everyone in the workplace together. So when we said federal sector, our federal sector sisters and brothers are keeping the systems moving that we count on, the government that we count on, and they are facing even indictment and imprisonment if they don't go to work. And they continued they absolutely stood up against the plans of that administration and made it possible for the rest of us to say, we're going to gather our arms around them and stand up for our federal sector sisters and brothers because if they can't do their jobs, we can't do ours either. And when we made that very clear, when we called for a discussion in the labor movement for a general strike, and we made clear that flight attendants would not go to work. And every single person I talked to about this would ask me, where are the pilots? I would say the pilots are with us, but talk to, talk to us as flight attendants because if the pilots don't fly a plane, it doesn't take off, but if flight attendants don't staff it, it doesn't take off either. We have to redefine what labor is. That's what strike does too, is it challenges our assumptions about who has power. Women, immigrants, People of color, these are the people who have borne the brunt of coronavirus. These are the people who have done the jobs that make it possible for us to live. And these are the people who today have the power to change the course of labor and change the course of our history and change our world with healthcare for all, with green jobs and the ability to form your union without retaliation or interference from management. The PRO Act, we have clear demands for the right to secondary boycotts and no repl permanent replacement of strikers. These are demands for power that give every working person power, including those who are immigrant workers. So we're setting our demands. We're making very clear the urgency of this moment. People are having to pee in bottles in the course of their jobs. We're defining for the rest of the world what this means and why it means something to them because we are coming out of a shared experience like no other before. We are ripe to organize in millions right now and order over 85 million people want to have a union. We have to open our arms wide to every working person and lift up the work that every person does and understand very clearly where the power resides because back to the corporate elite, they have the control and they have the money, but they do not have the power. The power rests with us. That's what strike is about. That's the word that we have to share because people are looking for answers. They are sick and tired of working more than one job, of working overtime, of having their, the value of their work be defined by the boss and having to work harder to make more as opposed to make, making more for the value of the work that we give. And so this is a moment when mass strikes can take place again, when we move forward on voting rights, civil rights, human rights, the right to healthcare, the right to a green new world, <laughs> the right to live, without someone's knee in your neck.
that's what this is about. That's what this moment is about. And that's what strike teaches us. And so when those flights stopped, those few flights in LaGuardia stopped because we had defined very clearly what working people were willing to do. I think what we really have to take in is that the corporate elite understood in that moment, if they let that go on for even another couple hours, workers would understand the full breadth of our power, of our ability to take control, of our ability to take over simply by putting our hands in our pockets. And they couldn't allow that to go on. So we have a job now and always to share the contents of strike, to share the living history of the people who really matter, the very interesting stories of those ordinary people going to work, making a living, and then finding their power like Jennifer Bates and her colleagues have found in the Amazon warehouse where whether that vote is for the union or not, they've started something that can't be stopped. There is majority support in that warehouse and there is majority support all over this country for unions because people have had enough. They've been squeezed far enough and they want to fight back. And we have the answers for them. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more tonight about strike, about all the stories within it, but truly this is just about power and that power is owned only by working people. And that's why I'm so excited that Jeremy asked me to be a part of this 50th year anniversary, why I'm so excited to say the word strike. Let's say it again. Strike, 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 strike. Do not be afraid to say that word, own it, feel the power in that. Because working people have power. If we understand and if management understands that sometimes we have to beat it out of them. Sometimes they just have to remember the beating that they're going to take for them to deal fairly with working people. People talk about labor management relations and labor peace. And the one thing that we have to learn from our history in reading about strike is that the struggle is never over. If you are not exercising your muscles every day, you grow weak. If you are not understanding the struggle that it takes to keep working people in power, to help people understand their own power and stand up to the forces that would wish to exploit them and treat them as disposable, then we lose our ability to hold people accountable. When I told management at the beginning of coronavirus that they had to deal with us on our plans or else they were not going to get anything, they believed us <laughs> because we had shown them before. It is possible to have relationships with the corporate elite, but we have to understand that those relationships are built on the willingness to struggle, are built on the willingness to take up the fight are built on the willingness to strike when necessary. And they have to understand that we'll do it. So we can never stop preparing for the strike. It is not a last resort. It is our power. It is our place. It is understanding the value of what we give to this economy, to our communities, to our democracy, and to the world. That's what strike is. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And that's what we all have to say. Thank you so much to Jeremy Brecker for making it possible for us to have this discussion and know who we are truly as working people standing together. Thanks, everybody. And one last time, we got to always end it with, I've got your back. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Can we we'll get another round of applause for Sarah? I want to see everybody blow up the chat. Yes. Sarah Nelson, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, so much for the fabulous introductory keynote for tonight's great panel. Um, like you said, bosses don't make good jobs. We make good jobs. Bosses don't make a livable planet. We make a livable planet. So as we move now to our panel, it's my great pleasure to introduce your moderator for this evening, Mr. Javier Morillo. Javier is a labor leader, advocate, writer, and storyteller. 
He consults uh, in labor and philanthropy and is a fellow at the Center for Innovation and Worker Organization with me here at Rutgers. He served for 14 years as president of SEIU 26, uh, which unites over 8,000 immigrant workers in Minnesota. As a storyteller, he's been featured on national public radio and his work on police unions written in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd has been influential nationally, noted in The New Yorker and Planet Money. He's the creator and co-host of a popular podcast that covers state and national politics. And as you'll see this evening, he's also a world-class panel moderator as well. Javier, it's yours. Thanks so much. And uh, wow, what a what a fantastic uh, speech from Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you know, when I first became a labor leader, I would go to rallies, and um, and and I and one of my pet peeves about the labor movement was that I felt that we were very eloquent about all the things that have been done to us about why we were not powerful, but we were less eloquent about about the future, about about painting a brighter future, about about speaking to our power. And I would listen to speeches and think like, well, who wants to join that movement? Like, you know, it's it, it's depressing as hell. And um, it was just so so wonderful to hear such a uh, an uplifting um, uh, call to to uh, to arms really from 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 Sarah Nelson. So so thank you. And it's my great honor to to moderate this panel. And when I get um, right into it, I think what I'll what I'll do is going to. Um, uh, you all have seen um, bios. I'll, I'll give a little uh, abridged version of, of of our panelists' um, uh, uh, bios so that we can have a, a conversation about um, the 50th anniversary uh, edition of Strike. Um, of course, Jeremy Brecker is with us. He's a historian and author of 10 books on labor and social movements, including Strike, Brass Valley, History from Below, Building Bridges, Global Visions, Global Village or Global Pillage, Globalization from Below, and the just released Common Preservation in a Time of Mutual Destruction. Um, we also have Rebecca Collins Given. Is she's an assistant professor of labor studies and unemployment and employment relations at the School of Management and Labor Relations at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. She's published widely on employ, uh, employment relations in healthcare, comparative welfare states, and labor studies in journals such as Social Forces, ILR Review, and British Journal of Industrial Relations. Next, we have Kim Kelly. She's a freelance writer and organizer born in rural South Jersey and currently based in Philadelphia. She is a labor columnist for Teen Vogue, and I will not, I will never stop loving that Teen Vogue has a labor columnist um, and a columnist on class and labor at uh, The Baffler. Previously, previously, she was an editor at Noisy, Vice's former music and culture vertical, and a member organizer of the Vice Union. And finally, last but not least, is my former colleague, Valerie Long, at um, in the International Executive Vice President of, of the Service Employees International Union. Um, she leads SAIU's member engagement and leadership development work. She brings more than 30 years of organizing and leadership experience to the role from organizing her own work site to being one of the pioneers of, of the Justice for Janitors campaign model through which a largely Latino immigrant and subcontracted workforce was able to win better wages, benefits, working conditions, and full-time um, hours. So, um, I just uh, I'm going to start maybe with just a general question. Ask you all to introduce yourselves and, uh, and give us an uh, uh, opening statements. But but really just on the importance of of labor history. I'm struck in thinking about today is thinking about about this panel that the experience of being on strike is different than the memory of or the telling of and um and how we tell the story of strikes is just is as important as what happens in them themselves and um and as we reflect on the the, the 50th anniversary of the of the book jeremy wonder if you could um uh, speak to and all of the panels will go through one by one uh, on the the importance of of telling these stories and and of, of harnessing the power of of a strike When I mute you, uh, Jeremy. Okay. Okay, we said. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep, yep, you're good. You're good. Okay. Um, so I, I'm a little overwhelmed by uh, Sarah's talk and by this event as a whole. Uh, and um, I think. Uh, the real answer to the question, why does labor history matter? What's the point? Uh, is really been said uh, better by Sarah than I can say it. But I think that uh, uh, history and experience of working people is something that has been largely 
uh, hidden, largely suppressed. Uh, when I uh, finished Strike, I had never met a labor historian. Um, and I had just found a few books in the college library, a short shelf. Uh, and I was astonished at what I discovered. Uh, strike waves of millions of workers, workers shutdowns of whole cities, nationwide general strikes, seizures of vast industrial complexes, and even armed battles with artillery and tanks. And uh, this is things that I never uh, learned in a history class, uh, even um, having been, already been a social activist at that point, I didn't learn them in the movement. Uh, and so the uh, ability for us to know this history, I think is important, uh, as Sarah says, for our identity as working people, for understanding that, and equally for understanding the kinds of power that workers are capable of uh, acquiring uh, through solidarity and through collective action. So, uh, as I say, I, I was asked to also to talk a little bit about the background of strike and especially its development over the decades. Uh, what does it mean to live with a book like this for 50 years? Uh, and the um, original purpose I had in writing Strike, uh, when I discovered the, the amazing stories that are there, uh, that were there, but that were practically unknown, uh, was, uh, first of all, to reveal the radical traditions of workers to working people and make it available to them uh, as a uh, uh, a way of having a new understanding of their uh, uh, reality and the potentials that they had through action. But also at that time, we had a radical student movement. We had the anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, we had the civil rights movement. Uh, and we actually had a burgeoning uh, uh, um, militant, labor movement, uh, which you can find in one of the older chapters of Strike described. Uh, but these forces were highly divided from each other. And a central part of the purpose of my writing Strike was to build a bridge between those forces uh, and find a way that they could understand by understanding the history of working people understanding also how that fitted in with the opposition to war, how it fitted into the environmental crisis that we were already experiencing at that time, the racial crisis that was uh, uh, front and center then as it is today, and give people a way of understanding, uh, as Sarah said, their commonalities uh, over uh, all of those differences. The other, key point was to show where the power is and to show that uh, dependence uh, of employers and of society on working people, on ordinary folks, uh, was the thing that actually established the basis for power because, uh, as the old song said, uh, the boss would be mighty lonely if everyone decided to walk out on him. So, Conveying that in a concrete historical way was another part of the central purpose of strike. It was never meant to be a comprehensive history of American labor. Uh, it was focused on two central things. One, rank and file self-organization. What did it mean for working people to organize themselves from below? And secondly, what today we would call getting out of silos. The, uh, division of workers into separate trades, separate, uh, uh, what well, used to be uh, called by the Wobblies, the American separation of labor, uh, the uh, ability to easily to turn one group of workers against another, and similarly, uh, different groups in society turn race against race, native born against immigrant, 
and all the other ways in which uh, we are uh, play, our divisions are played on. So uh, those are really the two core themes of strike. I have had the privilege of updating it just about once a decade over the last 50 years. And so I've also built, as we go along, a uh, ongoing history uh, as it happens, so to speak, of the development of the working class and development of the uh, problems and challenges that working people faced. And um, obviously I can't summarize the whole history of that, uh, uh, but one aspect of it is the development of structural changes, globalization, the deindustrialization, and the other changes that have completely changed the context in which working people have to struggle, uh, but also major changes in worker strategies uh, going global, the adoption of Gandhian nonviolent action techniques, corporate campaigns, community labor and, uh, alliances, and I could, of course, go on. When I came to writing the revisions of strike in the 21st century, we had faced a very substantial decline in conventional strikes. I mean, substantial, like a tenth of what they had been historically. Uh, but what we found uh, as we began looking at it was the rise of what I call the mini revolts of the 21st century. And certainly, uh, just to take two examples, because they're represented here, the teacher strikes uh, that, uh, and more broadly, the whole movement for public education that they were the tip of the spear for uh, was a mass strike on a historic uh, 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 scale uh, and continues to be a mass strike uh, on a historic scale as we battle the effects of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, um, sorry, uh, can follow my own notes here. Uh, the ending of the government shutdown, which was a colossal and unique uh, exercise of worker power. And there's a dozen or more other examples uh, that I develop in the last three chapters of strikes that are uh, directed to this uh, uh, more recent uh, period uh, and really represent new inventions of how to engage in class struggle in a time when it's very, very difficult, though still not impossible and necessary to win strikes. So let me just wrap up by saying that the greatest thrill connected with strike is that each decade, I've had the opportunity to meet new generations of people, uh, especially young people who have found something of value in strike. And mostly I've met them in uh, uh, elevated places, uh, church basements in most cases, but uh, it's great to be in this situation today uh, where I can virtually meet many, many other uh, people, some of whom are uh, uh, old uh, labor history scholars and labor history buffs, but I'm sure some of you are uh, people who are just discovering uh, labor history and are ready to pick up the banner of the struggles uh, and carry them forward. The other thing I want to say is that I hope the story of Strike the Book isn't over. Uh, as Judy mentioned at the beginning, uh, I'm doing a regular series of commentaries uh, called Strike Commentaries on Solidarity and Survival on the LNS website. And that's one way that some of this story is going forward. Um, and uh, I just finished actually a mini book a uh, mini web book called People Power in the Coronavirus Depression, uh, which uh, carries forward uh, the kind of study that's done in strike to deal with the struggles of the past year, uh, which um, uh, will be posted on the LNS website uh, within a few weeks. Uh, and 
uh, just published two companion books, Save the Humans, Common Preservation in Action, and Common Preservation in a Time of Mutual Destruction, which are an attempt to sum up what I've learned about social movements and social change over the last 50 years, both in the, the labor piece of it, but also in the other work I've done on globalization uh, and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, conditions and the way that various kinds of social movements have responded to them. So let me just say that um, uh, some of you probably have heard, I just passed my 75th birthday uh, and I won't be able to keep on revising Strike forever. But my fondest hope is that others will continue recreating Strike, incorporating new learning to contribute to the self-organization and self-liberation of working people. Thanks so much, Jeremy. That was fantastic, and um, and and I think we can we can begin building on uh, on that work through our conversations now. Let's um, from Becky Gibbon, um, uh, reflecting on the importance of of labor history in the context of your own work. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you. It's truly, I guess, people say this a lot, but it's really an honor to be in this esteemed panel celebrating Jeremy's amazing contribution, and then. Um, I never like to speak after Sarah because she gets me and many of us emotional, but, um, and then to be up here with everybody, Valerie and Kim and all of you, it's really um, a fantastic occasion. So thank you, everybody. Um, I just want to say a few things. I want to keep it brief because there are so many uh, great uh, speakers and conversations ahead. Um, I've been thinking a lot about sort of learning our history, but also taking strikes into the future. Um, unlike a lot of people who are, I guess, in the academy, although I, I hope I'm not only in the academy, I have been on strike. And so when I talk about and when I write about that strikes change you, it's really personal. And I think when I think about, you know, learning from our past and what strikes do for our future, I think about how strikes change you. And anyone who has been on strike and frankly had a family member on strike, and then, you know, expanding out, been on a picket line, maybe your teachers were on strike and you went out in solidarity with them. That experience profoundly changes you and strikes are contagious in the best way. It's a, it's a muscle. And if we exercise it, it keeps, it keeps uh, getting stronger. And I think that the way that strikes change you is absolutely profound. And we need to keep thinking and talking about that. Um, a couple a couple of ways I've sort of been thinking about this. One is um, just in terms of the massive teacher strikes that took place. And I um, put together a book on these teacher strikes since since 2018, but also going back to the uh, Chicago teachers in 2012 who inspired so many of us. And I have to pay respect to, to Karen Lewis, who um, really was a visionary behind, honestly, the fight for public education and the willingness to walk off the job. And when I think about those strikes, what I see is teachers across the country learning from each other, and they learned that strikes work. They, um, the strikes were contagious because they worked, because they brought wins. Um, most of my research is on education and healthcare, and those are two huge areas for strikes right now. And that's because we see that they work, and it's because the workers primarily are female, they're devalued, they're degraded, and their work is um, not only driven by the need for a paycheck, which is a perfectly legitimate motivation for having any particular job, but also motivated by something more. Right now, 800. Uh, nurses are on strike at St. Vincent's Hospital owned by for-profit tenant healthcare in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, in a couple days, they'll be on their one month anniversary. That is brutal. Being on a picket line for a month without getting paid, without knowing whether um, or when you will win your fight for patient safety uh, and for sufficient staffing level levels, that is profound. That strike will change those workers, but it will be hard. I don't want anyone to think that because strikes are exciting and maybe a little romantic, that they're easy. They are hard, but they can change you and they can change the world. I, I was heartened to see that just, I believe yesterday, 
the educators in uh, the United Teachers of Los Angeles won um, a childcare subsidy for the teachers, for the bus drivers, for the custodians, for all of the school employees. There is no doubt, there should be no doubt in any of our minds that they won that because in 2019 they went on strike and they built power and now they have the power to make big wins for themselves, their students, their families, and their communities. The last thing I want to say, um, in this book that we put together, Strike for the Common Good, we have brilliant voices of teachers, community members, um, organizers. And Nicole McCormick, who's a brilliant um, elementary school teacher and organizer in West Virginia, wrote a really amazing chapter, and I'm just going to read three sentences. Um, she talks about the chapter is called Owning My Labor, and it's really about her very, very personal uh, coming realization and consciousness that what she owns is her labor and that she needs to own that power and can use it. And she says, strikes work. When we forget that withholding our labor is possible or worthwhile, we're leaving an essential tool in our struggle for a better life off of the table. When we withhold our labor, truly recognize that it belongs to us, we don't just get a seat at the table, we own it. So thanks, thanks all of you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited to hear from Valerie and Kim. Thanks so much, uh, Becky. I think what, what you said there about how it strike changes you, that's exactly what I was thinking when I said uh, that, that, uh, that uh, the experience of being on strike is different than often the stories we tell about them or the histories that we know or don't know uh, about them. And our, our next speaker, um, uh, Kim uh, Kelly, can can speak to a lot of, uh, to to organizing that is happening today in the digit in the, the tech sector and uh, journalism. So super excited to have uh, Kim Kelly be uh, uh, next. All right, thank you so much. Gosh, I don't know how I'm gonna follow the likes of like everyone on this panel. I'm like. I'm about to start crying again after after Sarah's speech. Um, so I won't take up too much time because I want to hear what everyone else has to say. But hearing Rebecca talk about the, the, the difficulty of getting through a strike, it made me think back to when I was growing up and my dad's a union man. And so are my uncles and my grandpas and my grandmas. And my mom worked in the cafeteria, so she didn't have a union, which she really could have used when she got hurt on the job. She needed that protection, but the rest of my family had that. And one of the things about my dad being in a union meant that sometimes he had to go on strike. He was construction. You know, sometimes you have to, to show some muscles. Sometimes you have to show the boss who's boss. So I remember what it was like for a daddy to be home for a couple of weeks at a time, for, you know, the grocery bills to be cause for concern, to him having to go to more union meetings, coming home mad. Like, I haven't been on strike myself because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a freelancer. I'm an independent contractor. And right now, I don't really have that ability. Once we get the PRO Act through, maybe things will change there. But, you know, I haven't, so I grew up with that kind of background, that kind of class consciousness, that kind of inherent understanding that unions are a good thing and they'll look out for you and they'll have your back. And it wasn't until I got to my former job at Vice where I actually was able to participate and partic participate in the organizing and founding of a brand new union. And up until that point, I had been, well, I'd been the heavy metal editor. Like I know that most of y'all know me from my work in the labor and political world, but I've been a heavy metal journalist since I was 15. Like that was the world I was coming from. That's why I have all these tattoos. But um, when I was at Vice and I got super involved in the organizing effort there and I started going to every meeting, it was on every committee and was, you know, barking at the bosses on every meeting we had. They nicknamed me the pit bull. Um, and I realized that my priorities had shifted a little bit in terms of coverage as well as where I wanted to spend my energy. And so that's not kind of how I, I shifted into being what I am now. And getting laid off didn't hurt because I was like, well, I don't have a job now, so I guess I need to, to build something new. And, you know, as a labor reporter, labor history is my constant companion. Every story I write, every action or campaign or strike that I cover, every question that I ask, that builds directly on the work and the labor and the struggle of the people who came before. You know, I, I, the last time I saw Sarah was actually in Bessemer, Alabama, when we went down to, to visit with the, the Amazon workers there who were organizing. Now, I've been going back and forth there for the past couple months. I probably spent about a month there total, and I've gotten to know some of the workers who are involved and the organizers who are there to support them. And just being even a tangential little part of that struggle, like, you know, peeping in and seeing what's happening on the inside, it's been so inspiring and so incredible because not only are these workers, they're going up against a giant. 
They are pushing back against the richest, one of the most powerful men in the world. They're building directly on the legacy of those who came before, and they know it. Like, they know their labor history. They know that Martin Luther King Jr. was a union man. Like, they reference the, san the sanitation workers in Memphis. Like, they know that they are building, and they're building something for people that come after them, too. Like, even if people haven't had time to pick up a book, having those conversations, being part of those struggles, being part of these efforts, like, that's labor education, too. You know, growing up, I, like my bio said, I'm from the middle of nowhere. I'm from... Uh, it's not really on many maps. I'm from a, a nature preserve in the middle of South Jersey. I went, I was in the same school, for, uh, the same little brick building from kindergarten to eighth grade. Our library was like a couple shelves. I didn't know anything about, you know, the Triangle Factory, uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, or the uprising of the 20,000, or the Delano Grape Strike, or Haymarket, or Blair Mountain. Like, I had no idea about any of those things. I only found it because I sought it out. And thank God there were books like Strike that were there once I burrowed around and found the right sections in the library and found the right spot in the bookstore, right? It was, it was like finding this whole other world that just opened up, that blossomed, where I realized like, oh, so people like me and my dad and the people we know, like these broke working class people that don't have much of anything, like we actually can win, like we can get ahead, we can fight, we can win, we can actually we can do something. We don't have to feel powerless. And lots of other people just like us have actually succeeded. Like we, we have options if we work together. And just being able to carry that with me into the work I'm doing, which is, you know, it's such an honor to be able to cover labor at this time when so much is happening and people are finally re realizing and waking up to the power of work itself and to the idea that all work is essential and all workers are essential and all workers deserve dignity and a fair wage and health care and safety. Like, it's not just, you know, the, there is this, this funny narrative that we still see in, in media coverage from people that don't get it, where, you know, the working class is just the white guy in a hard hat, or, you know, the coal miner. And they're very important and they're there, but there's so many other people that make up the working class. And, you know, when we talk about the tech worker movement, like, yes, there are people who are coding and who are making big public sentiments, but... There's also like the people that clean the buildings and keep the grass cut. Like it's a it's a bigger wall-to-wall -wall struggle. And we can't just, you know, pick and choose who counts because we all count. And I guess that's, that's just the perspective I'm bringing to the work I'm doing, to the book I'm writing, which I kind of have to get on doing that, you know, but it's, I'm hoping it'll be kind of a spiritual successor or, com or companion to strike. Like that's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm union made and union strong, and I'm so happy to be here with y'all tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. Woo! Um, Woo! Yeah. So, uh, so Valerie, um, so property services where, where I come out of at SEIU and where uh, you were for many years, we never, we didn't ever stop, right? That there was a long period with the labor movement um, where there are not a lot of strikes, but, but, uh, but, but strikes and the threat of strikes, strikes votes is something that we continued to do or to, to flex uh, uh, power, especially in the janitor's division. So I'm um, excited to hear kind of your thoughts on, uh, on, on labor history and the importance of, uh, of, of, of remembering um, and telling these stories. Yeah, thank you, Javier. Uh, we we come from a history in our division where we just said we're going for it. We're going to withhold our labor, even if it's a minority strike. We're going to withhold labor to disrupt the status quo, and it was important for us to do that um, because that's how we like um, challenged um, power. Um, Jeremy, thank you. I read your book 30 years ago or something in the 80s. Um, an organizer who was a boss of mine said, you have to read Strike. So I read it and I appreciated reading it and um, just read it um, in your abridged, uh, uh, updated version and really still appreciate um, what you say about the power of withholding labor. It's important that we understand our power as workers. And um, I've gone through my life just being inspired by workers withholding labor and also just understanding that, you know, they're like sick and tired of being sick and tired. They really um, understood that they have nothing to lose. There's like minimum wage going on. There's um, a way in which they're working two and three jobs. 
and the 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 tactic of a strike um, really um, gives people a way to feel their power, um, lean into their power, and it's a way in which you just don't have it in another way. And I just think that should be appreciated by all of us that are talking about this kind of academically for workers who decide to take that huge step to withhold their labor, it's transformative. And I um, am just like wholly um, in awe of the risk that they're taking, the fact that we back their play as organizations to um, make sure that they have the support that they need to um, like deal with their power. And um, it's important. Um, I would say, and I would submit that there won't be another way that the tactics and the tricky dick stuff um, will be um, as important in striking. I actually think it's transformative in um, leadership development. It's transformative in people right feeling their um, way to like make a way. It's transformative in making sure that people feel their worth. Um, these things are important. And um, part of our movement, I would submit, is about workers feeling their strength. And it's important that us um, that are supporting workers, that are supporting the act of striking, um, it's not just a tactic. It's a transformative action that folks take, um, not romanticizing it, but respecting the power that it is. Um, so I appreciate this form for folks to just kind of like dig deep in um, this um, work and really figure out how we can continue to support it, you know, um, Jeremy, I appreciate that you abridged and updated your um, book to add Justice for Janitors, what me and Javier come out of, and Fight for 15, um, like modern day, not quite the same as Medawan or coal miner strikes or steel worker strikes where my father and grandfather, I grew up in the Midwest in Lorain, Ohio. So I, I am part of that history as well. Um, these are modern day um, disruptions and strikes that we've done, um, teacher strikes, et cetera. I would submit that it's still our most powerful mechanism to show the boss, whoever the boss is, whether it's building owners, employers, whatever it is, that we can withhold labor and we can make sure that people kind of understand that we can feel ourselves and like stand up. Um, so Jeremy, thank you. And to all the panelists, um, thank you for your perspectives on this. It's, it's an important topic and we should never let go of the fact that we can um, withhold labor. It's a way to um, oh, grow, our movement in a way that really transforms leadership. Um, and um, I just appreciate being part of this movement because it's really important. So thank you, Javier. Thank you, Valerie. So um, I'll start uh, our uh, discussion. So what, one of the things, you know, that I've that's interesting to me about this moment today, in addition to the red for ed strikes that you, and you have um, work organizations that are not unions that have struck, worker centers um, and uh, Amazon here in, in Minnesota, um, but also that like, like youth climate strikers, that calling, using the word strike and how uh, it is it's it is striking to me how, how much the word is used these days, given that, in general, you know, right that 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 many of the the young people who are who are using the word now, probably you know might might not come from families that went on strike because we went through a long period of the labor movement where that was not the uh, um, where strikes were not um, 
were not the dominant uh, tool be, being used. And so I would ask you you all, and, and uh, maybe we could uh, start with Jeremy, Jeremy or just put us popcorn it and um, whoever wants to answer, but are, are the relationship between like to the of the labor movement to other social movements like climate and um, and and like is, uh, I, I I have strong feelings about this, but there are people who feel that this that's mission creep of the of of the unions and just your your thoughts on on the the tactic of the strike and how it's used in relation to what you know the labor movement versus vis a vis us other social movements. Uh, big question, uh, and one that this, the answers are by no means all in. Uh, I think the starting point for me is that the range of problems that working people face are not so much as they once were focused entirely on the relation between a particular group of workers and their employers. So that if you talk about climate change and the threats of climate change, if you talk about uh, racism and discrimination and elimination of the right to vote, if you talk about uh, the uh, problems of being an immigrant and not having your basic human rights recognized because of political forces that are uh, targeting immigrants. And I could go on with a list of things that are of central importance to working people, but that are not primarily a matter of the relation between a particular employer and a particular group of workers. And so if we're going to have a labor movement, if we're going to have a workers movement that is uh, going to succeed because it addresses the real problems that working people are experiencing and care about, then it has to be concerned about the full range of problems that working people face. The other piece uh, that I would say here is that we're facing real changes uh, and you can see this decade by decade through globalization and through deindustrialization, in which the specific power that workers had in industrial uh, settings, uh, and, uh, factories, and uh, uh, to a considerable extent, all mines and that that kind of sector that was the at one time the core of organized labor, the actual bargaining power, the actual number of jobs uh, both decrease enormously. And that traditional power of the strike is uh, uh, severe, was severely undermined, which is the primary reason that strikes became much less common than they had been through most of uh, American history in the last century or so. Uh, the, that does by no means indicates that strikes are obsolete or that they can't be effective. And the teacher strikes would be a great example of that. Uh, and we could add many more uh, where successful strikes are being conducted today uh, and will continue to be in the future. But uh, part of the theme of strike is that uh, where, where, when working people find they are not able to use their the tactics they've used in the past, it doesn't mean that they have to give up. They begin an experimental process of looking for new tactics and new methods. And I think that that's what we're seeing today. And that's what the many revolts of the 21st century uh, that I wrote about. Uh, and that uh, Valerie gave uh, some great examples of uh, is uh, central to where we go. So give up the strike as a useless, meaningless, obsolete uh, form of struggle? Absolutely not. We use the most of our creativity that we can, the most of our imagination that we can, the most of our experiment uh, with new techniques or modified techniques that we can. Yes, that's what we need to do. And if people want to associate that with a tradition of strikes and use the term strikes for the uh, uh, all kinds of strike, climate strikes uh, and fight for 15 strikes and all the other 
things that we're uh, experimenting with today as a working class and as working people, uh, great. Let's use the term and say, and it's also been used historically to mean this, have this narrower meaning, but we're broadening it to cover a wide range of the things that working people are doing today to try to exercise power, to make a decent life for themselves and for each other. It's all about disruption. We got to disrupt the status quo because the status quo is really messing us up. <laughs> so we just have to disrupt that. And so I, I, I just want to thank you for that because really the book strike is talks a lot about strikes and gives the history of a lot of strikes, but it's really the broader focus of disruption and the ability of people to use disruption as a way of moving out of powerlessness uh, 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 and showing the dependence of the powerful on them. That's really the core theme and the core story of strike. So even though in dealing with the 20th, 21st century, it deals more uh, with what I call min the mini revolts, it's very much part of the same story because they are ways that people can use disruption as a way of uh, making a better life for themselves and for each other. Look, I think there's a couple things that we have to recognize. One is that unions are not self-selecting organizations. So this is everyone. Um, as we are getting more and more into different ways for the boss to try to divide us, they have traditionally used racism, they have used sexism, they have used all kinds of ways to be scared of people who are not like ourselves in order to try to keep us divided. Now, another way that they are trying to do this is to define everyone by their political identity. And so unions are the only place where uh, this is not a self-selecting organization. In fact, the boss hires everyone who is in the workplace. So this is where we can work through the major issues of today because we actually are a group of people who do have common cause and now have a reason in the workplace to come together and talk about those issues. So the great existential threats of our time, we get to actually talk about where it's almost impossible to do that in our neighborhoods, in our churches, um, in other places where we are because we're deciding to go where uh, we're safe with people who think like we do. Um, so this is really important. And then on top of that, um, having mobilized unions that are not just a service model union, but a, a real mobilized, moving, organizing union where we're recognizing that we have to have the ability to exercise our right to strike at any given time. Because there will be a moment when the crisis comes, the corporate elite never miss a good crisis. They will try to extract everything they can from that. And frankly, one of the reasons that we're not seeing solutions at the rate that we need them to be to take on the challenge of our earth burning today is because they know that if things become desperate enough, people will accept anything. So if we're not getting together and talking about these issues in our workplace and coming up with solutions together and being ready for that strike moment, because it will come, there will come an urgent moment. If we are not ready to exercise our power as working people by standing together because we understand our common cause so well, because we have been organizing all the time and bringing ourselves together and coming out on the picket line for different issues where you find out that you, uh, where you make a real bond with other people, like Rebecca was talking about earlier, then you're not ready to take on that crisis. You're not ready to take on that moment of leverage. Imagine if we had been ready. Imagine if grocery workers had been ready to say that they were not going to go to work at the beginning of coronavirus. There would not have been two months of $2 of hazard pay. There would be a permanent increase in value for that work in the amount that people are making every single day and how we think of the grocery worker's job. That's the moment that we missed because we weren't strike ready, because we weren't ready to take on that greatest moment of leverage and we weren't ready to act together. And we weren't ready to think strategically about the leverage that we had and what we were willing to do to back it up. So this is the one place where we can do this. We have to organize our unions in order to take the greatest advantage of this moment in defining our demands, coming together, exercising our power together, and actually being able to talk about what we have in common, not what, it, we, what divides us. You know, as Sarah is saying, that is one of, a union is one of the few places where we have that common ground. We know that, that we're all kind of coming from the same place, at least in this particular respect. And I mean, if a union is going to be a tool of working class liberation, it needs to be a tool of working class liberation, of Black liberation, and queer and trans liberation, Indigenous liberation, 
disabled liberation, women's liberation, like we can't leave anybody behind. And we can't bow to this sort of this idea that like, oh, we can't, you know, we want, don't want to deal with the social stuff. We don't want to deal with this political stuff. We just want to deal with bread and butter issues. Like, well, no, because something that you think is just a political issue is someone else's life. You know, two of the actions over the past summer that really stood out to me, talking about the ways that workers are kind of reconfiguring the, the word strike and the action strike was back last June when the longshore workers in the West Coast shut down the ports for eight minutes and 46 seconds to honor the memory of George Floyd, who was murdered by police. You know, here in Philly, that same summer, we saw a group of sex workers who work in clubs, dancers here in Philly came together and launched what they called the stripper strike. Now the clubs were closed, but they used community support and public pressure to force their bosses to pay them better, to treat them better. Well, it wasn't a traditional strike, but it was coming from that you know, like, like liberation minded idea. It was using worker power. And I think we're gonna see more of that. And I hope we see more of that because you know, not everyone is in a union yet, but most people have a job and most people have access to that kind of collective power. They just need to figure out how to seize it and, you know, use it for good. Yeah, that disruption is really important. I am. Um, Go ahead. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to say, I mean, I think a couple, a few things here, and um, this uh, can mention some of the discussions of things like uh, Wisconsin public employees, the question about the right to strike, right? And that I think we, um, speaking of not exercising that muscle, we, we fell into a place where if someone said we didn't have the right to strike, we believe them instead of, um, you know, saying what uh, my friend Chris Brooks, who I think is on here and I always repeat to each other, this is, these are not God's laws, right? No one can give you the right <laughs> to strike or take away the right to strike. You can walk off the job and that goes for what Kim was saying. You don't have to have a union to go on strike. It probably helps, probably helps you build that muscle and exercise it. But everybody uh, has the ability to walk out on strike, everybody who's performing any kind of work and nobody can take that right from you. I mean, Sarah, um, talks has done so much work with federal employees who don't have a right to strike, but guess how we ended the government shutdown, right? And so whether you call it a sick out, a walkout, a strike, no one can take that right away from you. Thanks. That was actually what where precisely was going to go was ask you about that in the context of Red for Ed, right? That 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 this happened in states where where people don't have collective bargaining rights, and um, and I, I remember uh, Sarah when the the shutdown um, was happening, and I remember reading your tweet, and and as someone who grew up in the labor movement, as you just described, Becky, the first thought you just sort of get these like the vapors of oh, can she do that? And like <laughs> and like and and I was reminded that you know my mentor in the labor movement and in property services at SAIU, uh, Stephen Lerner, as, as uh, uh, likes to say that um, if it's if it's a if it's a you powerful tool for empowering workers it will be, it is or is or will be made illegal. Like, um, and so, so being well, like strike, a uh, strike is about transgressing those, those boundaries. But, but uh, Becky, could you, could you speak to this, the power of like, of this happening in states that very red states, which very different than the Wisconsin situation, I think, like in results and, uh, and, and maybe the retail. Yeah. I mean, there's a really interesting trajectory. If you take a historical view of the history of the National Labor Relations Act was partly in place because of the havoc that strikes were wreaking and, and they said, let's not have so many strikes. Let's channel all that conflict into a nice bargaining table and um, everybody will just, you know, push paper back and forth and um, that'll resolve things. And we won't have to worry about strikes disrupting the economy. And we won't have to worry about workers literally murdering the boss. We'll just have a better mechanism for resolving conflict. And what we saw is, in some, to some extent, the truth of that, right? It did um, massively reduce um, big strikes. And we also saw in Red for Ed that there were way more massive strikes in straight states where there was no bargaining table, right? So when we looked at particularly West Virginia and then Arizona, which was 
unbelievable example of workplace to workplace structure tests and organizing to get to the point of a statewide strike. Um, what we see is that when workers don't have a bargaining table, they look at what tactics and tools are available to them and they can't make a bargaining table quickly, but they can make a strike if they build to it and they organize and they do their structure tests and they escalate and they get to a supermajority. And so we really see um, how those legal avenues can actually be turned around and flipped to our advantage to build more power rather than sort of saying, if I don't, if I don't have a bargaining table, how can I strike? Which, you know, strategically makes no sense and will only keep workers quiet. And Sarah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious uh, if give, given the reluctance to, or rather the, the, the acceptance within the labor movement that the rules are the rules, right? And that, you know, like you're, you're during the life of the contract, you can't strike. Um, was, did you have pushback within the labor movement? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, people, people were scared. People were, I, I, I'm telling you, I, I got questioned all the time. Are you sure you want to use the word strike? I mean, it, we can't even say it, let alone do it. Um, yeah, there, there was real concern. Um, and so we had to focus on what we were willing to do. Uh, so we, we had a couple things going on. We were talking about um, the labor movement should talk about a general strike. I mean, a lot of people sort of like conflate that and think that I just like called a general strike. You don't just do that. But uh, what we said was we should talk about it. And even just that idea that we should talk about it was powerful. Um, but what we were doing separately within our union was we were talking about defining why flight attendants were going to strike. And um, we were setting up very clearly that uh, we could not afford to go, continue to go to work in unsafe conditions. And in fact, it's our responsibility every single day to keep the public safe. Um, so any day that we see an unsafe condition, we have the right not to work that flight. And so we really used that right. We defined that well for our members. Our members um, understood very well that it probably wasn't a very good idea for air traffic controllers who have to get things 100% right all the time to avoid any aircraft cra uh, crash or incident. Um, to be going to work for 35 days without getting a paycheck and be stressed to the hilt about how they're going to just take care of their families. That's probably not a very good idea. So this was something that, that um, our members understood very well. And we were very clear about what we were willing to do as a union, even as we called on the rest of the labor movement in solidarity to talk about supporting the federal workers. Um, but yeah, there, there was absolutely pushback. Now, I think that we have a, a real advantage in AFA because we have a history in 1985, we went out um, in a sympathy strike with the pilots um, that was not for our contract, but flight attendants went out on the 17 day strike with the pilots, we won uh, that strike, but it didn't change our contract at all, but it certainly did show management that we were willing to stand up and that made a difference in our bargaining. Beyond that, um, a Carl Icahn uh, fired all the TWA flight attendant strikers. And after that, we knew we had to have a new and creative way to strike. So we looked at the law and we created a whole new strike tactic called chaos, where we did not would not announce when or where we were going to strike. And in fact, we brought Alaska Airlines to its knees with only 20 25 flight attendants ultimately striking, got 60% raises and incredible um, improvements in that strike. And it's a strike tactic that we have continued to use because we flipped the script on, on strikes where the first day you start to report on how long is it going to be before people start to cross the picket line. All of a sudden, nobody knew what the, what the um, narrative was. And so the, the reporters had to start reporting on the issues of our strike and why we were in this conflict with management. And so being creative, being nimble, being willing to do that, it didn't take any less solidarity though. I wanna be really clear about this. Um, we had to go nine months at Alaska without even striking at all. And the, it was an open shop during the time. People were able to opt out of paying union dues. Only 10 flight attendants in the entire union op opted to do that. And so it was the solidarity and the willingness to, to back that up and back up what the union was willing to do with all of those workers that gave us the power to get that result, even though ultimately it was only 25 who struck. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a difficult thing. You have to be constantly talking about it. You have to exercise those muscles. You have to be willing to be creative. You have to be able to be nimble, but what you really have to do is just go back to basics to find the problem, set your demands, add urgency and, and say what you're willing to do to back up those demands. And that's it. That's the whole thing. And you have to be doing it all the time so that people understand what that is and how they can make a difference when they stand together. I, I'll just tell you one other really quick thing. You know, it happens naturally sometimes in the workplace. Um, management made a big mistake of saying that flight attendants could no longer bring their own containers with their own wine from home to take on their layovers. And um, that was overturned in 48 hours because there was a massive outcry from everyone. The union didn't even organize that, but it was an uprising in the workplace and they were so mad at management that the policy changed like that. Um, that's just one example. We have a lot of them, but um, if people are willing to take action together at any time, uh, the power changes immediately. And like Kim said, sometimes you got to show the boss who's boss and that's what we can do. Amen. Yeah, so that was fantastic. And, uh, you know, the um, I, hearing you talk about the fear that a lot of folks have just reminds me. And and I, and, um, and one of the things, you know, that the book is, is that is uh, rightly praised for is just centering the, the experience of rank and file members. Um, and and I wonder if you all could speak a little to, um, to fear. Uh, because I, I think, you know, that that strike, it is, you're putting a lot on the line. When a worker puts puts their body on the line, puts their job on the line, that's uh, you know, I, enormous respect uh, for, for, uh, for that decision. Um, it's a difficult one. It's a scary one. And so speak to just the, what it takes to get to that point where people feel powerful together to be able to to do something that's really scary. Yeah, um, I have a story th that I'll just share because I think that is salient to what you're asking, Javier. Um, Anjali Rodriguez Lambert is a teacher from Northern California. She went to work at McDonald's after being laid off from her teaching position at the start of the pandemic back in March, whenever that was. Within weeks, she and her coworkers organized a 48 day long strike after management refused to you know, give PPE and you know the rest of it, um, telling workers instead to wear coffee filters and dog diapers for masks. It's just like totally insane. Um, she was scared. She was fed up as well. She just like, was like, forget this. I just have to like, you know, lay down the gauntlet and not um, deal with this anymore in this way. And people make these choices every day. Um, and uh, that's just one example. As you know, Javier, we have all of these stories in our union. Um, and there are all kinds of stories in this movement of people just like setting down the gauntlet and saying, I'm done. I'm not going to deal with this anymore. And that is the, the, the strength of striking. It's the strength yeah. of actions. It's the strength of just like saying no. It's like, I will not take this shit anymore. Excuse my language. Um, so that's just a story I wanted to share because I thought it was salient to your point. Uh, Rebecca, like, what what was you know? I know you. Yeah. You, you talked to a lot of teachers in in red states where where strikes are not common. How how do people get past that point? I think it's just you know bread and butter organizing. It's one on one. It's finding workplace leaders. It's organizing. It's talking to each other, and it's escalating. People who've never done anything or never taken a risk and seen how it, they can win a demand and pay off, they're not going to walk out on strike tomorrow. But you know, and we saw it. Um, Rebecca Gorelli, a great Arizona teacher, has a chapter in our book where she really walks through, and it's interesting because it was statewide. They used a lot of digital tools, but then a lot of in-person as well. And the relationship between the two is great. 
But you know, what's the first step in a red for ed campaign? Get people to wear red. If someone won't wear red on a, on a, you know, to work when they're not withholding their labor, just to show solidarity, they're not ready to go on strike, right? So first wear red. Then wear red and put a picture of yourself on social media with the hashtag. So if it's on Facebook, your friends and family see, and maybe you engage them in conversation. It's very, very simple tools. We know what works, but you can't skip them. You can't skip ahead to a strike. You have to do that organizing, that conversation, and that building because people are fearful, but they overcome that fear when they see that each escalating step has worked and that their coworkers are doing it with them. Yeah, totally agree. I think too, you know, just really quickly, it's sometimes when you talk about fear, is it the fear of the individual workers or is it a fear of the union leaders who, um, you know, who have the responsibility of leading that group and understand the gravity of what they're asking? And oftentimes the workers are far ahead of the leaders. <laughs> And, um, and the, if you stay focused on what the issues are, oftentimes that resolves the fear because is organizing a shop hard? Yes. Is organizing for a strike hard? Yes. Do you know what's harder? Watching your union get torn apart, watching people lose their jobs and lose their homes and your communities dry up. All of that is a hell of a lot harder. So, if you're feeling stuck as a union leader and thinking about, well, first I have to have a strike fund and then I've got to tell everybody what this is all about. Guess what? People know what it's about. Get out and talk with them and you can make an assessment. And as Rebecca was saying, of course, you've got to have these escalating tactics and you've got to be able to test the, the uh, commitment of the people. But if you're talking about what the problems are and what their, the demands are around fixing that, I find every single time that the workers are way ahead of the leaders and ready to act. And, and we, ha we have to be able to, to recognize that and just show the leadership and bring that organization to what the workers are already feeling. Because if we do not, um, it's, it's much harder to try to clean up the wreckage that happens if we don't act. Right. I, and I also think that... Um, what you find again and again in organizing is what people won't do for themselves, they'll do for a coworker that they care about. So if someone is harassed or denied their proper break time or unfairly disciplined, people will say, that's not fair. I want to do something about it. When it happens to themselves, they say, oh, I should suck it up. You know, this is a workplace. The boss has the power to do this, that, and the other. But when they perceive unfairness, against their coworkers, then they're willing to act. And I think that's really, really important to understand when we think about when they might be fearful and how they might overcome that fear. Right, we can't discount the power of solidarity, right? Like that's the million dollar word. And this just takes me back to the GM strike uh, in Langhorne, PA. I went up there in the strike line to talk with people and to support the strikers. And I talked to so many people who are older, who are you know, middle-aged or older folks who've been working in those factories for like 30 years, 40 years. And they're saying, you know, they're battling this two-tiered system where some people's work was valued more than others. And I was talking to these older workers who were like, look, like, I'm good. Like, I have my pension. I'm about to retire. Like, I'm benefiting from this system. But there are other younger people who aren't. And I'm here because of them, because it's not fair, because they're doing the same work, because they're my coworkers. Just that it, it's, you know, it's, it's harder to gauge. It's more ephemeral. But that spirit of solidarity is how we get anywhere. You know, caring about our fellow workers. It might sound a little kumbaya, but that's how we've gotten here. You know, you don't have to, to sit around in a, in a circle and talk about your feelings, but you can show up for your fellow workers and be like, yo, this isn't right. We need to do something about this. I have a little more power, so I need to use it. I mean, that's, that's the one-on-one -on -one bread and butter organizing that Becky was talking about. Like standing up for each other. That's, I mean, that's the most powerful thing you can do. Right. Yep. And it's self, it, it, it's, uh, it's about self-preservation too. It's not just about kumbaya, it's like, if I do this, I'm protecting myself, which I think is important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, we always, at the beginning of contract negotiations, we'd start, we'd make two lists, have a list of all the things that we deserve. Um, 
And 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 I and I always find it striking that you know we we push to people like sometimes to to think that like don't we deserve vacations? Don't we deserve to be on a beach and when we retire? Um, and then we make a list of uh, of what do we have the power to win? And that's what negotiations are about, and that's what a strike is about. It's about increasing your leverage so that the, so that the the list of all the things that we deserve can be the list of all the things that we um, that we win. And um, I just want to want to thank the the panel and uh, and uh, to Jeremy and for um, for for being with us because you know that telling the stories of strikes and telling successful stories of workers winning is the antidote to what I said at the beginning of, you know, the, these, these, uh, this horrible labor tendency to be very eloquent about all the things that have been done to us, but, but not so eloquent about, about a, a, a bright vision for the future. And, and you've just done an, or, an enormous service to our, to our movement for so many years by, by telling these stories that it had, uh, so that people indeed can, can dream bigger and, and build that power to, to, to win all the things that we deserve. So uh, thank you all and I'll, I'll pass it off to, to, to Todd to um, wrap us up. Thank you so much, Javier. And thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Sarah Nelson, Valerie Long, Kim Kelly, Rebecca Given, and of course, Jeremy Brecker for all the many years of updating and keeping Strike alive and bringing us all together tonight to have this awesome conversation. And boy, 90 minutes just flies by. I feel like we could just do this all night long. <laughs> and if we were in the same place, maybe we could just carry it over to the hotel bar. But unfortunately, that's not where we are right now. Maybe next time. Yeah. Um, but again, thank you to everybody who came out tonight. And thank you for all the work that you all do. And so many of you do on the ground each and every day, talking to your coworkers, listening to your coworkers, hearing what their fears and concerns are and overcoming those obstacles to organizing in the workplace, and then building those escalating campaigns and winning the world that we all desperately need and deserve, right? The world that, that's gonna be livable for our children, that's gonna have jobs that pay livable wages, that's gonna create a safe space for all people, for all humans to have dignity and respect in their lives. And I thank all of you for all of your work here in this panel and everybody who's joined tonight. And we look forward to seeing you again at, at future events and, um, Stay healthy, stay safe, and be well. Peace. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. One time, guys. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Forever. Solidarity forever. 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 Forever.